والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة العالمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So inshallah we're going to go ahead and get started now. Um, it's actually just to remind everybody again, it is the sunnah to pray sunnah prayers at home. So what happened is everybody got used to not following the sunnah. And so that's why, I mean, you can go to places, there's all kind of things going on. So let's just make sure that when we're reminded of the ayah or the hadith, that we think, okay, am I following this? And then if not, then we say, you know, I'm going to... The answer is always, but brother, I'll forget. Okay, but that's not an excuse to change the religion. <laughs> just could you forget. Make it easy on yourself. You know, buckle down, inshallah, you'll get it. So um, today we're going to continue in Surah Al-Baqarah. What is the main theme of Surah Al-Baqarah? Uh, basically understanding the comprehensiveness of the religion as it relates to the Israelite community and where we uh, fall in with law and with understanding purpose and uh, creed and scripture and character and relationship with revelation. It's a, it's a, it is the most comprehensive surah in the Quran. And so whenever it talks in terms of things that are related to the uh, Israelite nation, it's teaching us lessons. And, you know, a lot of people say things like, uh, oh, the Quran is this. If you go in the Bible, you'll find many parts of the Bible where God is blaming and condemning the Israelites. You've done this. You haven't done that. If you keep, this is why they were destroyed in this nation. And this, and then in their own history books, they say like this, interpreting uh, the thing. So... For us, it's not a matter of your title or your label. It's a matter of what level of commitment you have to the covenant of God. To be a, a submissive person who surrenders their will to the divine. So that brings us to our uh, discussion on the final testament. Okay? So it says, بِمَا أَنزَلْتُ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَعَكُمْ وَلَا تَكُونُوا أَوَّلَ كَافِرِينَ Believe in that which I have revealed, confirming what you already have with you, and don't be the first to reject it. So, God is directly revealing uh, Qur'an to the Israelite community of Medina. That's, that's how it was, um, that's how it was understood by the companions of the Prophet And so, basically God is imploring them to research why they're even there. You see, um, what is their purpose for being in this city of Yathrib in the first place? And then to look and review in their scripture um, the place of Muhammad and the Ishmaelite community as their cousins uh, from the Abrahamic forefather. So our scholars, they understand the term Israelite, um, not just specific to Jews. Uh, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was an Israelite. He was from the blood lineage of David, as mentioned, and no, and he was uh, from the tribes of the what's known as the Jews, the Israelites. So a lot of people want to separate them because of beliefs that were made later, um, which is fine, that clearly separates them. The theology and the creed and the understanding of uh, God and servitude and law and forgiveness in Judaism is very much the same as it is in Islam as we know it. Uh, Christianity has set itself aside with a very different creed, um, uh, basically the need for uh, a sacrificial atonement, um, a sacrificial offering of God so that we will have our quote-unquote original sin be removed from us. So that's why they're saying that God came down in the form of Himself as His own Son to be sacrificed to have the sins removed of the people. So this is a very different, very... Um, uh, diverging belief system. That does not change the fact that... Uh, so, when you heard the term Israeliyat as a Islamic jargon or language uh, terminology for tafsir, um, this would be something that um, trustworthy, reliable Jews or Christians who had embraced Islam, they would comment on verses of the Qur'an and the uh, some of the hadith and they would explain from what they knew from this. So they call it Israeliyat. So that's not specific to Jew. So this revelation is confirming the generality of the religion sent to all previous prophets. So once again, Islam is not a monolith. 
it's not just whatever Muhammad believed and this is the religion founded by Muhammad. It is blasphemy in our religion and offensive for someone to tell us that we believe that Muhammad founded the religion of Islam. Uh, he is the final messenger of Islam. And this is something we have to grapple with because um, Orientalist uh, academia basically puts us as uh, some people who believe in a guy named Muhammad who founded this religion. So we believe that he was the finality as far as the revealed scripture of religion. So all prophets sent to the corners of the earth, and that's another thing. A lot of Muslims have this idea that God has only favored the people in the Middle East, which is, which is a common theme in the Jewish uh, doctrine. The Jewish doctrine would not say it like that. They would say, God has burdened us with the responsibility of being His chosen elect, and we hold a bigger responsibility to follow the law and to carry its message than the rest of the people. The rest of the people, God will let them follow their innate, inherent disposition, their fitrah, and they will be judged on that. That's, that's Jewish theology. That's why they're not making da'wah. You see what I'm saying? They're not a missionary because they believe that there's no need for it. God has tested with His own divine wisdom one nation of people, and to them, that's the Israelites through Jacob, Yaqub, through his 12 children, which one of them was Judah. And then that one was given special pre uh, precedence, and so it became Judaism. He was the fourth of the children um, of Jacob. Uh, peace and blessed be upon all of them. Our idea is that no, God has sent prophets to mankind, and He's been sending revelations to mankind. What makes Abraham significant is uh, that he is the forefather of the Ish Ishmaelites and the Israelites. And he was born and raised in a society, uh, Babylonia in the Mesopotamian time, when idol worship was standardized and people had pretty much lost their way. And um, he came as a young boy um, with a deep inner connection to divine truth and rational connection to it. So the need for rationality and religion to come together um, was uh, Abraham's special blessing. And so... Um, our uh, final message was sent to Prophet Muhammad confirming that concept. And that's very much emphasized in our scripture. Um, so, um, in the Quran, God in Surah Al-A'raf, God talks about who are those holy righteous people from the students of the prophethood. So, Islam is expecting everybody to be a student of the prophethood. See, Muslims often, you know, basically they, they corner themselves in this, what I've been talking about. We are, so there is a difference between from, from Ummat Muhammad, from the nation of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and being closed-minded. You understand what I'm saying? So, Ummat Muhammad is a special precedence that we are directly connected to the final messenger of God sent to mankind, in which there is a full reservoir of divinely, preserved and inspired inherited knowledge we can take from that. But that doesn't mean cut yourself off from the rest of the world. It doesn't mean don't learn from other people. Because if you have your criterion, that's one of the reasons why it's called the Furqan. You know why the Qur'an is called the Furqan? This is the criterion. Meaning, as you deal with other peoples and other cultures and other scriptures and other things hold, held sacred, you will be able to decipher with your connection to this revelation that which you will feel, that which will agree, and that which will be fulfilled in, in what we hold sacred, and then we can confirm that that is holy. Isn't it fair to say, uh, if such and such, say for example, uh, we obviously do not have the idea of prophets after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a very clear statement in the Qur'an, and the whole of the mainstream have understood it one way. So, but, say somebody came after the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and they were preaching Proverbs. Can we say, what they're saying is the truth, that what they're saying is sacred. Can we say that? Even if they're a false prophet. Yes, we can. If they're saying truth, what is sacred, that is truth, and it is sacred. It doesn't matter the one saying it. So somebody said, so are you a follower of this Sikh or whatever gurus? Because they've got some good stuff in their book if you ever read it. Okay? Very much deeply monotheistic community of Sikhs. Right? Uh, but obviously we do not agree with all of it. There's a lot of it that we would say our scripture would uh, show us 
um, that that is not a revelation from God. And the rest of it is definitely inspired by God. But is it a revelation? No. You see what I'm saying? It agrees with revelation. And how, how could somebody come to a conclusion of something that agrees with the Qur'an unless Allah has blessed them with that knowledge? You're telling me people can come out? You would be affirming secular belief system if you say, well, they just invented it. Now you're just agreeing that everybody invents religion now. You see? So there is ilham for somebody who would seek it. But at the end of the day, as we'll see in these passages, you have to seek prophethood. So for a Muslim, I'm interested, intrigued, when somebody gives me a book of the Buddhist writing, maybe he was a prophet. Is something wrong with saying maybe he was a prophet? Yeah, but the Qur'an confirms that there are people who were prophets that you did not hear about in the scripture. Okay? And he came before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So there is a potentiality that he's a prophet. So I could be intrigued and read it and confirm. I've read the Native American proverb books of shamanism. You will see it. So the idea of looking for prophethood is important. Okay? And that will confirm to you your faith, faith by seeing that which came before it and seeing that God has touched all people throughout history. But it's our responsibility to carry that forward. So it says here, those who follow the illiterate, الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيَّ الْأُمِّيِّ الَّذِي يَجِدُونَهُ مَكْتُوبًا عِنْدَهُمْ فِي التَّورَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ This is the point. So those who follow the illiterate prophet that was prophesied in the Torah and the Gospel. So um, basically, it should not be that someone say, um, the religion I was born in is the absolute truth because I was born into it. Is that a reasonable, healthy way? No. You don't, that being born into something does not make it true. There are people who are born into all kind of crazy ideas, and they're told, and it's, they're raised and it becomes normal. Not everybody's Abraham. Most people are not Abraham. Most people will go along with whatever's going on in society, Muslim included. So as a believer, we should search for truth. Just like we're asking others to search for truth. And then we affirm our own faith. We see the truth. We see the evidence in our faith. We look into the evidence of the Prophet So in Deuteronomy, chapter 18, this is Deuteronomy. You have to know that the, the Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament of the Bible. A lot of people don't understand what is the Bible. When you hear the word Bible, how many of you thought that means Christian beliefs? Christian scriptures? Huh? Exactly. So the Old Testament is Jewish beliefs. So there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. So Christian beliefs are the New Testament of the Holy Bible. And many Christians, you'll meet them and say, I don't even care about the Old Testament. It's all abrogated. No need for any of that. It's got war and laws and violence and capital punishment and about homosexuality, whatever. We're going to just say the New Testament. Jesus is loving everyone. So that's what we're going to like that one. Right? So you have to understand what they're talking about. So the Old Testament, the first five chapters or books, is um, Genesis, um, Exodus, um, Deuteronomy, uh, Leviticus, and Numbers. I think I may have the last two out of order. Those are the, what they call the Pentateuch or the Torah. Yeah, those are the five books. Question. Yeah, sure. When was the Bible combined together, the Old and the New? So that's actually a response to the Qur'an. A lot of people don't know this. Historically, the actual Bible as it is today, as a compiled document, came after the Qur'an. So amongst Jews, there was a whole history of rabbinical authority over Scripture. It was not common for your average Jew to know all the Torah and read it all the time and all that. They would take from the rabbi. And so... Um, uh, they might memorize lots of prayers and things like that. That was very common because they have three daily prayers, some of them pretty long. And so they learned all those things. They had daily prayers and things that they had. Um, but as far as a deep understanding of the whole Torah and having the whole Torah as a complete... And that was one of the things about you know Ezra, Hosea, is that the story is that they had lost it for many hundreds of years. They've lost the Torah as a whole community, as a Jewish nation. So... Ezra or there came in and he's reading it from heart and mind. Mm. And then they take it from him and they compile it and then it continues now. 
So that's where they, they, they gave him a special title as like the Son of God. You have to understand, the term Son of God, before Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it, it meant a holy, sacred uh, elect of the righteous, or the prophets, or something like that. They would call them Son of God. Not meaning, historically, in the history of Judaism, it is blasphemy in the whole history of Judaism to believe that God has literal children, or that God can become a person. That has always been blasphemy to Jews. Yeah. So Jew, so that was more like an exaggerated. So here's an interesting point. We have to talk about this. So you have Muslims saying things like uh, Jews believe that Uzair Ezra, who we call it in English. It's good to know English terms and to say them while speaking English. That way you can interact with people and communicate about what's going on. When you start throwing in Arabic words then they see you as an Arabic religion. Like you're not, your religion is specific to Arabic. It's seemingly not, take, you, can't, you can't, it's not universal. It's not able to communicate in all languages. And so they're saying, yeah, we have these Abraham, David, Ishmael, all that. Why can't you just talk to us in our language? So then you'll say, well, Arabic is holy. Now you give them this whole thing that the holy culture of the Arabs, and then you, get, you confuse them about the nature of religion. So anyway, Ezra, um, I will give any one of you a hundred dollar bill if you can find me one Jew on planet earth or one website on planet internet, Sheikh Google, in which any Jew is believing Ezra is the son of God and they are worshipping him. You will not find it. It doesn't exist. So some anti-Muslim people, see, your book is wrong, says, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ رَزَيْ قَالْ Pastors. It has been said. He didn't say, وَيَقُولُونَ Present tense or future tense. Says they said it. And we know why they have said it. And it's not something strange, because historically you have it in the Bible, Old Testament, before Jesus, that different prophets were referred to as the Son of God. So, um, it, it appears as though some people were emphasizing that point. The reason being is that, some of the uh, Jews who were trying to disprove Prophet Muhammad وسلم, they brought many arguments throughout knowing his message and hearing about it. But at no point did they say, well, this is ridiculous. We have never said that Ezra is the son of God. This is some strange belief. Your Quran is false. You have never heard of it. We've never... That was not one of their arguments. They brought arguments that they felt disproved. Islam and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this was not one of them. So when this point comes, it's like somebody coming and saying, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to write, uh, uh, The Quran says, The Quran says, The illiterate Prophet said like five places. It says, you do not write with your right hand. And we know the Prophet was right handed, for sure. So it's not like he was writing with his left hand. Okay? So, um, these things we see. So, um, so yeah, it's important not to say things with a... That's why we're here at a tafsir class. You don't want to go... You don't want to just read something in the Quran and go around militarily or... Uh, military, military, you know, like, uh, zealously. This is, this is it. This is the religion. You believe this, don't believe that. This is right, this is wrong. And you just basically read a simple translation. So you should be careful to study the Qur'an, to study creed, to study law in order to derive uh, a correct or a deep understanding that can be easily communicated with wisdom. So in Deuteronomy 18, 18 here, um, God is talking to Moses. He said, I will raise up from their kinfolk a prophet like you. And he will tell them everything I command him. And anyone who does not listen to the prophet that speaks in my name, I will call them to account. So, those of you that are aware of who the Prophet was and some specifics about him and the, how the Quran, number one, the phrase the Prophet, not a Prophet or that Prophet, the Prophet, meaning definitive. So this title um, seems to be a title. And if you look at the Quran, God never refers to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Muhammad. He does not. He says, Ya Ayyuhan Nabi. He could have said, Ya Nabi. Ya Nabi means, O Prophet. Like, A Prophet. But he said, Ya Ayyuhan Nabi. O the Prophet. 
which from an Arabic linguistic, just like any other linguistic, if I said, um, excuse me, the teacher, I need your help. Everybody would say, why are you saying the? Why don't you just say teacher? See so what I'm saying? It sounds weird. But it was very much a prophecy that the Jews were actually waiting for. Till this day, it's called city of the prophet. And if you hear most people, the, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And when the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So then it says, he will tell them all that I command him. The Qur'an has a very peculiar thing where God is saying Qul in the singular. Say, the singular masculine, meaning we all understand that it's a revelation for us to read and follow. But the scholars, they commented on it and they said this was some honor, some special place given to the Prophet And so that was confirmed in this one. Then it says he speaks in my name. He speaks in my name. There is no recorded human being in the history of mankind that would say in the name of God anywhere near like the Prophet That was something very peculiar to him. And the Quran, every chapter is beginning in this way. And so, and that uh, he said, I will put my words into his mouth. The Quran said, he's not speaking like things that come into his mind. He is speaking on things that are put into his mouth. Like, it's not his, it's something put into him. That's the understanding of this verse of the Quran. Uh, yeah, yeah. Even the prophets didn't used to say that? How do you mean? I mean, uh, Sayyidina Sulaiman, when he sent the book, we know, so that's basically the only place that we know that from. So if you read the whole Bible, you will find in very few places in the name of God. Okay? And so in the Quran, we know that when Solomon had sent a message to the Queen of Sheba, that he said in the name of God. But we don't have that as a standard. Um, even the Quran or the Sunnah does not suggest anywhere that any other prophets were doing like that. But we know that the Solomon did. So here's the interesting thing. Here's where it all comes together. And by the way, this, this, this combination that I'm giving you is a very solid combination. Because, and it's not because I want it to be and I'm a Muslim and I'm trying to prove my religion and stretching the truth. It just is done by the Christian scholars. They've done it for us. And it's just their, I mean, it's their tafsir from their own book that they've done. So in John, which John is from which part of the Bible? New Testament. New Testament. So the New Testament begins with the four Canaanical Gospels. This is important knowledge for any Muslim living in a Christian country. Very important, very beneficial to know what is the scripture, how do they see it, what is the importance, what, do I talk to somebody, how do I... Understand them. How can I communicate with them? How can I interact with them? If you come saying I have this religion you should learn and it seems very foreign You seem foreign you're talking all these Arabic words, and then you can't relate to them in any way Do you think that they will learn? Mm -hmm. They will not and that is the wisdom of why Allah said in Surah Ibrahim we never sent any messenger to a people except for that messenger would talk to those people to whom he was sent in their language, in their tongue. The word is bilisa. He could have said bilugati, right? He could have said by his language. The scholars said that the tongue is a deeper way to re reference um, this stuff. So, uh, let me give you an example. Is Syrians and Egyptians and Moroccans and Saudi Arabians speaking Arabic? Yeah, but is the tongue the same? No way, very different. Each one has a very specific style of, of enunciating it and explaining it. And, and it's, not just, it's not just the way it sounds, it's also the way it flows. It's a style of speech. Just like if you go to Texas or if you go to New York or if you go to Boston or if you go to California, folks talk very different English. If you go to England or Australia, this is all English. This is the language, but the lisan is different. So Allah is making an emphasis on specific culture and understanding it and being able to communicate with it in order for you to give this message. But yet Muslims make this big deal about exalting the original language of the scripture rather than 
communicating it in the language of the people. And that makes them a separatist, exclusivist group that is not successful in da'wah, as per the Qur'anic message. So, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the four Canaanical Gospels of the New Testament. They're the first Gospels of the New Testament. The story that we have is that Matthew, Mark, Matthew and John were actual companions. Hawariyu. They were the companions of Jesus. Mark and Luke are people who lived around him. And they heard his story from other people. And they have written it down from some intimate connection that they have with someone else. Each of these four are telling the same story. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell the same story. And as per my many discussions with my Christian pastor friends and studying, they admit that it looks like, if I'm not mistaken, Mark was one of the earlier ones, and that others built off of it and kind of took from it, and that you will see some overlap, and then you will see some very different ideas from one to another. For example, one of them will say that... Um, uh, Jesus carried the cross up the hill. Other one says, they carried the cross up. It's either one of them. I can't imagine if they were punishing him to carry the cross. They'd be like, okay, it looks like it's too bad on you. We're trying to torture you to death. Let me carry that for you. Does that make any sense? No. It doesn't. So, one of them said, when Jesus was supposedly put in the tomb, that when Mary uh, came, she saw that the tomb was moved away, mysteriously. The rock was moved. Now, another of the same, it said, it was there, and she had to have somebody move it for her. They have, and there's stuff like this in there. So this is, you know, differences they have in there. Um, so in John chapter 1, 19-21, these Israelites, they come to, uh, these are the Levites, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. These are the rabbis amongst the Jews living in Jerusalem. They have um, heard of a guy named John the Baptist, um, peace and blessings be upon him, who is telling everybody the Messiah is coming. I have come here to wash away the people and bring them into true faith. Meaning, the Jews have lost their way, and so we got to take you and dunk you in the water, which is what we call ghusl, al-Islam, right? Did the Prophet Sallallahu teach this? Of course he did. You're going to go come into Islam, you go take a shower with the intention of washing away your sins. So, He's doing this with the people. So they come and challenge him. Are you the Messiah? You think you're the, 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 the awaited holy prophet? He said, no. Then they ask him, are you Elijah? Meaning what? The Jews in the time of Jesus are waiting for Elijah. Elijah. Then they asked him, are you the prophet? This exact word. So they asked him three questions? Three questions. All three, he said, no. I'm not any of you. I'm John the Baptist. Okay. Yohanna or whatever. And so, um, so basically... And the Messiah was Sayyidina Isa. Right? Yeah, so we know. Okay. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. The word Christ Sayyidina is... Sayyidina Isa was not sent at that moment. Because John comes before him. Remember the story of Maria? Oh, they, they don't, they don't inter- they do meet. They time, they time. Oh yeah, they meet. The story is, in the Bible, Jesus needed to be baptized. This is, you, have to, you have to just see this. I don't have to comment on it. I'll just tell you what they believe. Because it's written in the Bible this way. That Jesus Christ, peace be upon Him, who, they, who Christians believe is God incarnate, or a small group of them, going against the mainstream creed, say He's just the Son of God, which is different than all others, because He has some holiness to Him. Right? But He's not God Himself. But the majority of them say He is God Himself. The majority of Christianity in its history have declared that Jesus Christ is God on earth, and that is a mainstream across all Protestant and Orthodox beliefs. Okay? So this belief about him is very strange when you read the Bible and it says Jesus heard about John the Baptist and he praised him. And he was saying, there is no one better on this earth than this guy. And then he goes to him in the river and then John the Baptist has to baptize Jesus who they believe was born without sin. But the baptism is all about washing away now in that story, it says that God calls out from heaven, this is my son in whom I'm pleased, and then the Holy Spirit flies across the sky as a dove. That's what they have. This is, I'm no, no comments from me, you take it 
for, for any person to hear that and they heard what they believe, it's hard, it's really hard. And that's why if you get into this conversation with a close friend who's a Christian, which I would not advise you to go to some strange person that you don't really know and bring these things up, because it would be offensive and, and put somebody in an awkward position. It'd be like you meet some guy and he's like, I heard your prophet has married a nine-year-old. You know what I'm saying? You leave people alone until you have a relationship, then you can have a more comfortable conversation and you've built a relationship and help people understand things according to what you know and according to what they know and so forth. Right? So, um, they will tell you our religion is very mysterious. Very mystical. We don't really know why it's like that, but that's the way it is. So that's where they're coming from. So you see, when people say, go read the Bible, it will help your faith. I'm just telling you, if you know anything about the Quran, and you read the Bible, your faith will rage. Number one, you will read things confirming. Number two, you will see that it's going to be hard to put your faith in that book for sure. Whereas when you read the Quran, you're going to see why um, we put our faith in this book. Well, with I, all due respect. I read, I read once that Rasulullah Sayyidina Amr Khattab came to Rasulullah and he was reading part of the Gospel or the, the Torah, I think. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to show it to Rasulullah Sayyidina I, I can't remember exactly what the incident was. It's one of the ma so many... It's one of, tells him not to. Yeah, this is one of the many hadiths that are passed on in many khutbahs and to kids growing up because of the fear of what might happen to them. It has no authenticity to it. It is da'if jiddan. This hadith has... There's only one uh, hadith that is authentic. It's in Bukhari on this issue. And he said, Hadithu an bani Israel wala haraj. And then he said, wala tsaddiquum wala tukadibum. He says... You can go ahead and talk about what you've learned from the Jews and the Christians, no problem. But don't just agree with them or disbelieve in them because they're Bani Israel. Rather, you need to use al muhaminun Ali. You use the Qur'an as a criteria because the proof, and it's not just belief proof, there is archaeological, anthropological evidence of the Qur'an being what it, what it is, you know, the Word of God. It's not like just someone believe it. And then there's all this evidence scientifically that makes it hard for us to accept that. That's something that our brothers and sisters have a problem with. And that's why you'll find most Christians are moving towards, and Jews are moving to reform. That's why now that the whole homosexual movement is really based upon, they will tell you it's unclear. It's not. It's crystal clear. It's more clear in the Bible that this is an impermissible evil act than it is in the Quran. It's much more clear in the Bible, like explicitly like, the one that did that should be killed. This is what it says in the literal Torah. Okay? But they're saying, yeah, we don't know if this was just people saying stuff, you know, because they had feelings about that and all that. So they're coming to a level of, because of a lot of rigorous scientific study about the Bible, that they're not sure, is this something to be taken literal? Meaning, can we just put some verses aside? I remember whenever I was invited to a Quaker group, and they said... Imam, aren't you, so in the Ramadan, do you guys recite these verses about war and jihad and stuff like that? I said, of course we do. And they said, well, why would you do that? I mean, you're an intellectual, you're a good man, you know? Why don't you just cancel those out? I said, but there's nothing wrong with these verses. And they were all looking at me like I was, maybe at any moment I'll blow them up or something. Like that. <laughs> and I told them, I said, no, there's nothing in the Quran that says going to kill a person who is not attacking you or an enemy of the state. Those are the two conditions. If somebody's attacking you or the enemy of the state, then there is a, a type of jihad, which is a very rare occasion that should not be, uh, it's not vigilante, it's not the business of any individuals or any characters, it's a, it's a state decision. You know, your only individual, somebody comes to kill you, you have the right to defend yourself even if it means uh, taking the life of the aggressor, um, if that's the only way out of it for you, right? They're like, no, no, that's not what I heard. I said, well, how about we study them? We'll just open the Qur'an. And so what they're doing is they're assuming that all religious books are like their religious book. Mm -hmm. That's the assumption. And that's where we're being pulled into that. We're being pulled into that. All oh, Muslims, we are the women. We talked about last week and some of the sisters, mashallah, came to me and said, I will lie. I've thought my whole life that just women inherit half of men because they're just like half of men. Like some Muslim sister thought that. That is not what the Qur'an is teaching. No scholar ever thought that actually. This is not a belief. But that's what we're having cast upon us from the outside because of this disdain for religion and the assumption and the search for what's wrong with religion and trying to find the gotcha. See? 
So, now, here's the point of this. John 1, 19-29. When? So, would you assume chronologically, when he said, are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Shouldn't that make sense that it goes chronologically? Because they're asking, the one we're waiting for now is the what? The Messiah. But then we think that Elijah could come. So I'm asking you about that. Then there's something after that, which is the which one? The last. Because they didn't ask about any other. The last one they're waiting for is called the prophet. That's what they call. That's what the Jews in the Bible. This is not our belief. We didn't. This is not Ahmadi not making it up. This is not Muslim reading into it. This is literally what the rabbis asked John the Baptist in the Bible. Every Bible says the exact same thing. There is no two translations about it. They said the final one is called the Prophet. Here we are, 1400 years after Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Khatim al Nabiyyin, the last of the prophets, right? So, in more than one commentary of the Bible, you heard of cross referencing? So, what they'll do is they'll put a little number next to a word, and that will be a cross reference, and they'll send you back to something else. That this is a clarification as to what that is. On the word the prophet, Christian, not me, Christian theologians, they put a cross reference on Deuteronomy. Now here's the interesting point. Most Christians hold that Deuteronomy is about Jesus. But some Christians clearly understood two separate ones. And it doesn't make sense. Moses and Jesus are very different in so many ways. Moses and Muhammad وسلم, are very similar. Mm -hmm. Establishing a nation, living a full life, mother and dad, a, a full law, a full scripture, complete, you know, becoming a great nation, as God has prophesied to Abraham in Genesis through Isaac and Ishmael. That did not happen with Jesus, peace be upon him. So they put the crossroads on the prophet to Deuteronomy. And they kept him like that? And yeah, there, it's, you can go on BibleGateway.com and find it yourself. Which they're saying, we know there's two. So Mormonism is a religion that believes the prophet is Joseph Smith. That's what the religion is. That's the only, that's the only group of Christians who figured this verse out. If you ask any pastor at any other church, um, who um, do you say is the prophet? And I'll tell you what I've met from many pastors who have degrees in divinity, PhD in divinity. You know what they all tell me? We really didn't think about this too much. It seems like it should be quite significant. Mm -hmm. An awaited prophet after Jesus. But see, that's one of the reasons why they needed to, in the Nicene Council, to deify Jesus, to close the door for their control over religion so that the new prophet can't come and assert itself as taking away their religious foundation and nation, and at that point it was an empire. Because this is after Constantine's son had become a Christian ruler of the Eastern Roman Empire. And it was the Eastern Romans who called for this meeting because they found that there are groups called Ebionites, Nabataeans, and Arians, all who were saying, Jesus is the Messiah sent to the Israelites. Not God or the Son of God who is a trinity. None of those. To them, they're just Jews. Now here's the point. Historically, in Judaism, it is blasphemy to believe God can become human. Or that God has a literal son from his essence. You see what I'm saying? So if you look at it, here's a big point to help our Christian friends to see um, the issue of continuity. Because someone will come very aggressive at you. They'll say, Jesus Christ has died for our sins, and they'll bring you the full emotional plea for what they believe. And that's their right, and God bless them, okay? But then you'll just say to them, but my concern is that if we're saying that God chose the Israelites, do you agree? What will they say? Yes. Those are, that's why they're supporting Israel. Because those are the chosen people of God. I don't get how after they rejected and supposedly killed Jesus, how those are still the chosen, but that's what they're believing. And so, um, they're saying that God has been connecting with these people, and the only people on earth He connects with. 
And he's been telling them and sending them message after message and profit and miracle and victorious, you know, support to all of their endeavors. And yet none of them ever believed in a trinity. And they never believed that the Messiah that they're waiting for, his purpose is to die for our sins. You see my point about continuity? This is a very, very crucial point I'm making for you. That you have all these prophets from Adam and Eve, thousands of years. The idea is God is one, unique, absolute, perfect, nothing like creation, cannot become creation. Everything derives everything from Him. He needs none of them. Okay? Very similar, right? And then Jesus came in the middle of time. And then some people sometime after him decided, well now we're going to change, God has basically, so here's the dilemma. Did God change his mind or he was hiding the truth from his chosen people for thousands of years? See what I'm talking about? It's one of the two. Either God changed his nature about who he is and what he is and what he could be because of his love for people and wanting to die for them so that they could be forgiven. Which then the whole point about law comes in. Did God reveal laws and make that a means of salvation throughout its mention in the Torah? Dozens of times. You must submit to the law of God. You must embrace the covenant of this responsible uh, uh, endeavor. If you don't, God will punish you. So if you follow the law and you repent, He will forgive you. That's the historical thing. So... Jesus comes, so we don't have to follow the law anymore. So Paul, one of the, pretty much the main founder of Christianity as we know it, he was suggesting like that. Is that, yeah, a good person with a good heart would, but the law doesn't do you any good in the hereafter. You've got to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, otherwise you're doomed. That was Paul's idea. All Jews were like, well, now it's been established, we're no longer uh, part of that group. It's now a completely separate religion. Um, so, Bani Qurayla, Bani Qainuqa, Banu Nadir, all of these tribes, they're living in Yathrib and they're telling. It says, فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ كِتَابُ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَعْهُمْ وَكَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ يَسْتَفْتِحُونَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ مَا عَرَفُوا كَفَرُوا بِي Right? So, and when the book came, when there came to them the book from Allah confirming that was, was with them. Before they used to pray for victory over the Arabs. And they would say, um, when the Prophet comes that we're waiting for. So one of the, you have to understand how this all fits together. I'm forgetting his name, but one, this is the father of Abdullah ibn, Abdullah ibn uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah. His name is Abdullah. <coughs> So Jabir ibn Abdullah, his dad, is one of a few guys who when he was dealing with some Jews before the Prophet ﷺ came out with his message, that they would be saying we're waiting for the Prophet. And when the Prophet comes, he will be dominant. Because they're actually, they're confirming what we read in the New Testament. They're there, the only reason they're there, and they have a very rabbinical group to them, they're waiting for this Prophet. Okay, and so, yeah. Rabbinical, a, a very strong religious group of Jews. So, they're not there for financial gain. It's Yathri. It's the middle of the desert. Not much for financial. All those went to Europe looking for financial. These ones are religious, waiting for a prophecy to come true. And so they were saying this. So when Abdullah, Abu Jabir, and a couple of the other early uh, people who embraced Islam, they came to Mecca and they met the Prophet ﷺ. They said, we have heard that you are claiming that you are the Prophet. And he said, yes, indeed I am. And so they asked him some questions that they had known because they're privy to a lot of things in Judaism that nobody from Mecca would be because they have deals with them and interact with them directly. The Prophet ﷺ was not known to interact with Jews or Christians in any deep way before it, even though that is the foundation of the official Jewish and Christian understanding of Islam, is that Muhammad met Jews and Christians, sat with them, studied with them, learned everything, translated to Arabic and made his religion. That's their idea of what we're following. So we know from our factual history that no, not even actually when it was claimed by the Quraysh that he's يُعَلِّمُهُ بَشَرْ لِسَنُهُ عَجَبِي They're talking about a Persian guy. If you read all the tafsir, there's an agreement about the guy's name and everything. 
He was a Persian storyteller that talked a lot about Hud and Saleh, for sure. Because it was a historical thing in that region. But he was not privy to Jewish stuff. Um, and he was not into all of that. So that would have been uh, the only argument there. Nobody ever said, oh, oh, we heard that Muhammad has learned from. So basically they came to the Prophet and they said, and then he talked to them and they explained, you know, they explained why they're there and then they embraced Islam. So then the Prophet said with them, Musab ibn Umayr, take this boy with you and he will tell you all about the religion. Was sent for the Jews? Uh, no, he was sent with... No, these three people came... They are uh, Mushikim from Yathrib. They're thinking, if this guy is the prophet they're waiting for, we're in trouble because of what they've been saying you know, this whole time. So what if we follow him first? What if we follow this guy? And so, let's go meet him. And they met him and they felt like he's not a fraud. And so then he comes back and then Musab comes, he teaches them the Quran. And then over the next year... They established 12 major tribal leaders who came and announced their faith to the Prophet in Bayat al Aqaba. And then the next year they brought 72, which 72 elder figures in the tribal system is representing maybe 5,000 people. It's a, it's, a, it's a lot of people that represents. Um, so um, that's how it all started. So it is this Jewish prophecy starting in Deuteronomy. Confirmed in John of the Bible, that was the beginning to the whole entire prophethood of Muhammad. Without those two things, he does not Islam does not become anything. Because they would not have accepted him in Yathrib. You see what I'm saying? These are authentic hadith, by the way. This is this is not me because I'm a you know have my Christian background reading into it. No, no. This is all well established stuff. These are very well firm foundational keys to the basis for our religion and the basis for communicating it to other people who would believe in the Bible. And so every, every time I have this conversation, it's a, very, uh, uh, it's a very awkward scenario once we get to the nitty gritty of these points. Yes? Uh, so going back to how you said that the Christians and Jews believe that uh, all Prophet Muhammad did was just learn some stuff from them. Why are, we, are they calling us a terrorist religion if all we did was copy We've got their stuff. MashaAllah, Sheikh. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I, actually I heard one time a guy on one, uh, um, it was one debate. I think it was uh, Jamal Badawi and some other guy. And some guy in the crowd brought this up. And the Christian guy said, let's not say that. Because then you're saying that, you know, all the religion is our religion. And so now you're just confirming that our religion is terrorist. Because if you're saying their religion is all that, then if, you're, if our understanding is we got it from that, so let's not take that route. Yeah. So whenever he says, uh, so don't hasten to disbelieve when it, when it all fits as mentioned. Don't disbelieve before the other Israelites. It would be disbelieving in their own scripture. I mean, even if you study the Old Testament and the prophecy and the prophethood, like I was recently reading on, uh, it was uh, some uh, website they have for the Jewish community. And somebody asked the rabbi, he's a Hasidic, you can tell he's Hasidic. He's an Orthodox rabbi in, in New York, he speaks very good English. Hasidic? A, Hasidic is a very strict, ultra-Orthodox group of Jews. So I asked the rabbi, um, we've heard that there is a uh, policy in England that every religion, every people who believe in a religion, they must pick at some place in their high school another religion other than theirs to study in, as an elective. We're making this a po po to establish diversity and to respect religion. So I said, all the Muslims seem to be picking Judaism over there. And so could we pick if we have Jews over there, can they follow the Qur'an, listen, read the Qur'an and study it, and study Islam? The rabbi, he danced around this one, but his, you know, basically what he said was, the reason why many Muslims would want to is that for sure there's no question what we do know in the basic tenets that we know about Islam is that it's basically the same religion as Judaism. It's basically the same stuff. So it makes it very easy for them because they can relate to everything and we have, very, we have one God, creator of the universe, He's not human, he's not triune, he's one. 
He's the creator. He said Noah, Moses, Abraham. We all agree in all these things. So um, that, that, that would make a lot of sense. And he kind of reiterated that in like three different ways for like two minutes. And he said, but I'm asking you, can a Jew read about Islam? He said, well, I'm not really. I don't know too much about Islam other than just these basic things that I've said. So I couldn't make a definitive ruling. And so then somebody asked him, but uh, Rabbi, you know, um, why don't you do that so you can have a better idea about it? He said, we are know what we're following and that's sufficient for us. We, you know, we're waiting for the Masih. He said, we're waiting for the Messiah. When he comes, we'll know all we need to know. And so we're just waiting to see that and we'll know him when he comes. It will be obvious to us. And so that's their, kind of their idea. Um, is that, and I remember meeting one of the, from the Nutera Karta, uh, Rabbi Weiss, one of the most humble, sweet guys you'll ever meet. Um, he's one of those anti-Israel uh, Hasidic Jews. And um, I asked him, I said, did you ever read like the Quran? He was like, we don't read past what we have in the Torah and the, the laws of the prophets and the things, you know. Our, our scripture is sufficient for us. I said, but what if, you know, what if there's something out there that you didn't know about or that it might be interesting to learn? He was like, we have thousands of years. We're, we're the Jews. We have thousands of years of prophets. We know. We're right. How does that sound like to you? Many Muslims? And this is not the right way to be. Because then you'll prove that you're a closed-minded, blind follower of your religion. You don't know based upon a comparative analysis because you're a humble person who doesn't just assume yourself right and everybody else wrong based upon my parents telling me. You actually go out there and form a relationship and come to a comfort in your faith and a confidence that you can communicate to people and knowing very well everything that they believe and feeling you know, like you have your basis and why you would say, I'm a Muslim and I'm not such and such or such and such because here's what evidence I follow. Anyway, we went over time. The brother asked me not to go too much over time. And uh, this is, uh, we have to follow the advices of our brothers, inshallah. So inshallah, we'll continue on this uh, um, uh, next week, inshallah.